I'd like us to look at 1 Corinthians 15. Let's turn to it. 1 Corinthians 15 is the longest and most extensive treatment of the New Testament on the subject of resurrection. It has a total of 58 verses. We're not going to look at all the verses today. Today we're going to look at verses 3 and 4, and then 20 and 23. All right, I'll read. Verse 3. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Go down to verse 20. But Christ has indeed been risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through one man. For as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So those verses will serve as the backbone for my message today. I'll be weaving several verses from the Bible to make my points. I only have three very simple points. One, we're going to look at the crucifixion. Second point, we're going to look at the resurrection. And finally, the last point is what it means for us. First, let's look at verse 3. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What scripture was Paul talking about? Well, he may be thinking about Psalm 1610, which says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Or the famous uh, Isaiah 53, which details much of um, Christ's life. In verse 10 it says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After, verse 11, After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. But you know, beyond the Old Testament, even many of the Jewish traditions and practices pointed towards a Messiah that would die, that would suffer, and raise again. Consider the Passover meal, which is the most central and the most important festival in Jewish culture. It has many, many symbols to illustrate this. Let's spend some time on it. So, I have here unleavened bread baked from Jerusalem. Yeah, it's called matzah. All right? At the beginning of the Passover meal, three pieces of matzah um, are prepared. Okay? And as you can see, matzah is baked in such a way, you see the piercings, the holes, and the stripes. All right? So that's, again, Isaiah 53. By his, pier- by his piercings, our transgressions are forgiven. By his stripes, we are healed. All right. So matzah, um, we recognize three pieces. Um, Represents the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Early in the meal, the middle piece is broken in half. And one of it is given and hidden by an adult. All right? At the end of the meal, children are 
instructed to find the hidden piece. And once the hidden piece is found, the adult negotiates with the child for the ransom of that piece of bread. Get the picture here? The middle matzah, representing Christ, is broken, hidden, and resurfaced at the end to complete the meal. It was during this point of the meal during Jesus' own Passover with his disciples when he said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after this, Matthew tells us, he then took a cup, which for centuries have been called the cup of redemption, and said to them, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After that, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and you know that this was the night of all nights of our Lord. You remember he was arrested, brought to sham trials before Caiaphas, Herod, then back to Caiaphas. And by the early morning on Friday, he was brought before Pilate. He had been spat on, punched in the face, ridiculed. He's dehydrated. The cold of the night caused him to be having hyperthermia, hypothermia. That was just the beginning. Pilate found him not guilty, six times in fact, but the Jews did not care. Remember this, the same Jews that earlier in the week, earlier in the week, was touting him to be the king of the Jews, waving palm branches, thinking that he was the Messiah. The same Jews. Pilate had him scourged, thinking it would satisfy the bloodthirsty crowd. Scourging is a practice that's brutal and horrendous to the body. They would tie a naked prisoner on a pole and have Roman soldiers stand on each side. Each will have a whip called flagella. It's leather thongs that has rocks and bits of bone weaved into it. What they would do, the prisoner will be here, they would whip the, pay, uh, whip the prisoner, flagella would, would wrap around the bear back, and then they would pull it back. The bits of rock are designed to bruise the flesh, and the bits of bones to rip it apart. They would, they would do it um, one after another. And they would take turns when the soldiers get tired. Jesus was scourged. The bloodthirsty crowd could not be satisfied, however, and finally relenting, Pilate washed his hands and handed him over to be crucified. It was 9 a.m. The cross is the most cruel execution method ever invented. It was started by the Persians, who had a deity called Ahura Mazda, Mazda like the car company, who was the creator of the earth. Followers of Mazda considered the earth to be sacred, and thus no, no executions should taint the earth. They started hanging their criminals on trees to be executed. Alexander the Great adopted this method and brought it to Egypt and um, Carthage, North Africa. And it was perfected by the Romans. And by the time of Christ, it was thought that there were about 30,000 um, Jews crucified. 
That's a lot of people. Crucifixions were always done near highways or at public places so as to warn people not to cross Romans. I was talking to Richie outside last Sunday, and I saw the crosses on the front of our buildings, our building, and realized actually the measurements are very similar to the ones used during Palestine during Jesus' time. It is called a Tau cross, Tau, like a T, where it's around six feet on the cross beam and then eight feet on the vertical beam. Why do I say it's the most cruel execution method? Because it is designed to produce a very, very slow death with maximum pain, suffering, and humiliation. In fact, Roman citizens, Roman citizens are exempted from the cross. People who were crucified die from asphyxiation. That's a fancy term for suffocation. But it's not the lack of oxygen or air that's the issue. You see, right now, in normal respirations, you sitting there and I'm here, inspiration, which is taking in of air, is active. You contract your diaphragm, lungs expand, air goes in. Expiration, however, is passive, meaning your rib cage and your chest wall just goes back to the original shape, and in turn, air comes out of your lungs. The cross takes away expiration. You cannot breathe out. So in order to exhale, in order to breathe out, Jesus had to pull himself up. All right? It's unbelievably painful and exhausting. When he pulls up on his wrist, it's painful because the nails have already punctured his median nerve. You can feel it. Median nerve runs between these two tendons here in the mid wrist. All right? So first he had to pull up, think about all the um, pain, all the cramps, all the funny bone sensations that you know that's called paresthesias that he's, he's uh, experiencing. His open back from the scourging would be scraping the back of the beam, right? And finally, he would thrust himself up with his legs that were nailed also. That would send immeasurable amount of pain down his legs. So at the apex, though, he's able to breathe out. <sighs> By then, his muscles are fatigued, cramping, and he would slam back down, back down like that. He would take a breath <gasps> and realize he can't exhale again. The process starts again. Pull himself up, back scraping, push up his, his legs, exhale, and then slam back down. You know, they, um, what they would do to speed up the, the death process is, is, is to uh, break the femur, right? And what that is, you cannot push up anymore, and so you just die, suffocating. You can inhale, take in air, but you cannot exhale. This process is unbelievably torturous, unbelievably painful. It's literally excruciating. The pain that can only be described as out of the cross. And why did he die? Did he commit a crime? Did he disobey Roman law? 
In John 8, he asked his accusers, Which of you can convict me of sin? None of them could say anything. In fact, in the sham trials, they had to employ false witnesses. No, according to our passage, Christ died for our sins. And I want to point out that Paul in the Bible never attributes sin to someone else or something else except our individual hearts. In Matthew 15, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. You know in Genesis where God confronted Adam and Eve about their sin, what they do? They both blame someone else, right? Remember that? Eve blamed the serpent. Adam blamed the woman that God gave him. The problem with blaming others for your sin is that it assumes that you are innately good and that something or someone else made you do an evil thing that you didn't want to do. The Bible attributes your sin to you alone and my sin to me alone. I'm afraid that it doesn't leave any room for blaming neurotransmitters, chemical imbalances, past traumas, racial injustices, social economic disparities, etc. So he hung there from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. At noon, the whole land went dark. At 3 p.m., he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And after he let out a loud cry, he gave up his life. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came and buried him in a tomb. A large stone has been rolled over, was rolled over the mouth of the tomb. The tomb was sealed. It was Friday night. There's something final about that. When my dad died, I didn't feel like he was truly gone until we lowered his coffin to the ground. He was truly dead. There's a closure about it. And so was Christ. He was really dead. Now let's look at my second point, the resurrection. Back, back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Scripture tells us that Christ was buried for three days. How does that work? I've always wondered about that. Well, the Jewish people counted one day as if, if any part of the day was touched, so to speak. And they started their days at 6 p.m. That's not too strange for me since um, in my Chinese culture, age is counted as any part of the year lived. So I'm already 41, even though my birthday is in October. Um, so Christ was buried on Friday, right, at around 3 to 5 p.m. That's one day. The whole of Friday, 6 p.m. to Saturday, 6 p.m. is the second day. And Saturday, 6 p.m. to Sunday, 6 a.m. dawn, was the third day. I can imagine that during this time, the whole spiritual realm just held its breath. The angels held their breath. Is God the Father going to accept this sacrifice? Is God going to turn back on His creation? Or is He going to make things right again? No doubt the demons held their breath. Is this the final victory? I mean, they just killed the Son of God. Is death going to win again as it did on all creation? 
casting its curse once again. The whole creation, whole cosmos, held its breath. Would God the Father raise God the Son back to life? Is this the moment when the seed of the woman finally crushes the serpent's head? Then the songwriter says, his heart beats. His blood begins to flow. Waking up what was dead a moment ago. And his heart beats. Now everything is changed because the blood that brought us peace with God is racing through his veins. He breathes in. His living lungs expand. The heavy air surrounding death turns to breath again. He breathes out. He is, he is word and flesh once more. The Lamb of God slain for us is a lion ready to roar. This is the happiest and the most wonderful event in human history. Long has the world been enduring the sin that Adam brought. Murders, death, sickness, thorns, thistles, injustices. We are estranged from God. We are estranged from each other. We are estranged from creation. This is the moment history turns around. For here stands, in flesh and blood, Christ the new man, untainted by sin, untouched by death. He will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Praise God that the serpent's head had been crushed. Death was defeated. Hallelujah. You remember that morning, Mary Magdalene turned and saw a man in her tears, supposing that he was the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. You know what Mary supposed to be a mistake was actually a most profound truth. For here stands the gardener of this new order himself. The gardener of a new Eden. The entire creation has been waiting on this new dawn. A dawn of a new race of humans. One that's not related by flesh and blood, but by spirit and truth. A new Eden, where once again we can commune with God, walk and talk with Him. A new Eden that includes all tongues, nations, tribes of the world. Praise God. For all, of, all here, we're all Gentiles that I can see. Let's look at the rest of 1 Corinthians 15. Let's first look at verses 20 and 23. We'll skip 21, 22 for now. Verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Verse 23, but each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. What does it mean that Christ is the first fruits? Here again, a Jewish festival lends us the meaning of this verse. The festival of the first fruits is celebrated on the Sunday after Passover. During the festival, a bundle is brought out from the whole harvest and tied as a sheaf. 
It symbolizes and represents the whole harvest. It is first heaved upwards as a heave offering and then waved to and fro as a wave offering to God. Like I mentioned, it's celebrated, celebrated the first day of the week, which is Sunday. So Christ died on Passover day. The next day with the, was the Sabbath. And at dawn on Sunday, the Feast of First Fruits, he rose and was the first fruits of the new harvest. Isn't that great? Surely this third day ties back to creation itself. In Genesis 1, 11, God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to your various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to the kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. Here on his resurrection, the creator, the original creator, recreated a new kind of harvest and a plant, which he himself was the seed. For my last point, let's go back to verses 21 and 22. For since death came through a man, this resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all died, so in Christ all were made alive. You see, to Paul, there are only two people that are of significance throughout history. Adam and Christ. You either belong to the race of Adam or the race of Christ. There's no middle ground. If you belong to Adam, you will experience death. If you belong to Christ, you will have eternal life. Now I would like to challenge each of you to examine which race you belong to. And the choice is a compelling one, isn't it? Consider what we talked about today. The crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection and the eternal life he brings. He offers the eternal life as a free gift. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, Paul says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. I'd like to extend this free gift to you, those who are in the race of Adam. You see, all that we talked about today falls short if it's not applied to faith in Jesus. Faith is where you combine all the knowledge, all the emotions, all the intellect, and place your trust in Jesus. And as the verse says, you will be saved. For those who are in Christ, I encourage you to rejoice. You are saved. You're part of this new harvest. He is risen. We are not the most pity of all people. We are the most envious of all people. For we now are able to do what the original Adam did was supposed to do, to walk and talk with the very God of this universe. You know the song, He Lives, He Lives, Christ Jesus Lives Today? He walks with me and talks with me and tells me I'm his own. You know the last line of that stanza says, you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. I don't think that line gives a full picture of the resurrection. Reason being, Jesus does not just live within my heart. I know that's true, that's emotional, we, we hang on to that, that's, that's important. 
But the Bible tells us he's currently living the right hand of God, making intercessions for his own. To think Christ's heart is currently beating, that he's a living being, that if he were to show up right now, we can touch him, for he's flesh and blood. He says it himself. He doesn't just live within my heart. He lives currently in heaven. Praise God. 